Hello and thank you for joining me for Load Balancing 101 in Kubernetes. My name is Christopher M. Luciano and I work for IBM. Today we're going to be going over how networking works inside of Kubernetes. We're going to pay particular attention to how these service types align with each other, as well as how networking works to travel from node to node by way of IP tables. A colleague, Srini, will join us afterwards to talk about some of the key features missing inside of layer four, layer seven load balancing, as well as demonstrating a shared load balancer project that we've been working on to solve some of these problems. So in our typical Kubernetes cluster, we're working with a few nodes and each of these nodes contain a collection of containers known as a pod. One of the missing pieces that we're wondering about is how does traffic get from node one to node two? What is the missing piece for pod one on node one to get to pod two on node two? This is where the container networking interface comes up. And the container networking interface provides with a spec and libraries for tearing down and bringing up connectivity between containers on the node. It takes care of IP address management known as IPAM and gives all of those IPs out from a range specified at startup time to your API server. And these can be either IPv4 or IPv6 addresses. You'll see a variety of different plugins inside of CNI. Thick plugins are normally associated with a sort of brand name like Calico or Cilium. And a lot of these incorporate thin plugins, which are found in the CNI plugins repository. And these are things like setting up a Linux bridge, DHCP, or port mapping. Also within the types are underlay plugins versus overlay plugins. Underlay plugins run in conjunction with your existing network, much the same way that switches and routers do. These are normally considered a bit simpler than their counterparts of an overlay network. And performance increases can be seen by using an underlay plugin as well. Popular protocols include BGP and OSPF. On the overlay side, we see a separate network created atop your underlay, thus overlay. And this is because it creates its own virtual network, thus segmenting your network from your underlying underlay. Popular protocols for this include VXLAN and GRE. So in our typical VM setup, we have one app per node. And this app uh, communicates with other apps by going through the ETH0 interface on the machine. Now in a Kubernetes sense, we have multiple pods running on the nodes. So how can these pods uh, work through the same node and hit pods on other nodes? Well, this is where CNI comes in. CNI, with CNI, each pod has its own IP and each container within the pod gets assigned a unique port. And then we have a collection known as an endpoint, which has all of these individual IPs representing the different pods. And we're able to do this by using Linux technologies known as namespaces to simulate the one app per VM setup. As we have seen before, we use pod network namespaces. Each pod gets its own network namespace with its own ETH0. And then it communicates to the root network namespace by way of a virtual ethernet set up for each individual network namespace that are bridged together to exit through the ETH0. So in this setup, we see a pod network namespace one would communicate with the virtual ETH0 and then it would hit the bridge and then flow out through ETH0 interface onto the node two. So we collect together all of these individual pods into an endpoints object. As we can see here for the kube DNS pods, we have two different nodes and on each of those nodes has a unique IP address representing that pod. And we have two different lists inside of the endpoints objects, 
for ready endpoints and one for not ready endpoints that have not passed their health check yet. And we can refer to these using uh, one VIP by way of a service. Similarly to the endpoints, we're selecting over labels on pods. So for the front end service, we look for all of the pods matching the front end label. And we're targeting individually the port 9376, which will be tacked onto our cluster IP and will point to port 80 inside of a pod because we can have multiple containers inside of the pod. So we want to make sure that we hit the actual web service application and not something like a logging agent. And this is by way of the cluster IP, which gets assigned from a range passed at runtime to your API server. These are reachable only with inside of your cluster. So it thus cannot be hit outside of your cluster unless you've bridged your way in. Another example is the node port service. And this opens up a port specified by whatever you put in for node ports on each of your individual nodes, such that I can hit the public IP of that given node with this node port, and I'll be directed to the given cluster IP resembling the pod that I wanna hit at its given port. These things wrapped together. And then the final way to do this is with the load balancer service. These are normally fairly cloud specific, but in the end, normally you get a TCP load balancer from your cloud and it is assigned a publicly addressable IP. As we can see in this example, it starts with 969 at the bottom. And we still, if we look into the example here, we still see node port and target port and 80 because all of these different service types get wrapped up in the end. So when I hit this public addressable and IP address, that resembles the load balancer, I get bounced to a node port backing the given service that I want to hit and then to the given cluster IP that I want to hit. There are certain cloud providers that allow you to go directly from load balancer to the given pod. And also they also have features like the pod ready plus plus application to make sure that I've tested does the load balancer successfully reach the given pod. If not, don't add it to the load balancing pool. The one thing to note here that we'll discuss a little later is when I'm creating each of these individual services, I'm getting a load balancer every single time for each of these things. Now, how does all of this traffic get there once it hits that given node port? What if it's not running on there? This is where the Kube proxy comes in and it's a component that runs on each of your nodes. And all it does is sit there and it waits for service creation requests that come into the API server. And then in the default mode, it'll create IP tables rules to direct this traffic in and out of nodes based on the cluster IP and the node port and all of that. There's a couple of different modes though, aside from IP tables, as we mentioned with IP tables is the default. And all this really does is creates a series of rules in the NAT pre-routing hook of IP tables. And this is a, a little bit simple. It's pretty simple to debug, um, but I put a trademark symbol on there because this is really dependent on how often you've seen the IP tables output. And in the IP tables mode, the output could get kind of messy. We'll go through an example of this a little later. Because IP tables creates a rule for each of these individual backends representing the pods, and you could have multiple rules depending on how many nodes this given pod is running on. The algorithm is really more of an O of N type of problem. To offset this a bit, the IPVS kernel module is used in the IPVS mode. And this is specifically suited for load balancing. It's got a more constant cluster lookup size. And the API also offers several specific load balancing algorithms that can assist you with 
load balancing your traffic, like round robin, least requested, or shortest distance. Be sure that you're looking into does your CNI plugin support IPVS because while it has existed in the Kubernetes releases for a while, some CNI plugins are still not available to leverage it. They're relying on the IP tables mode. General advice on which one to choose. IPVS has been shown to scale a little bit better in terms of CPU time as well as round trip time when you're getting above a thousand services. However, you only see a modest increase above IP, IP tables if in the IP tables mode you just make sufficient usage of application keep alive connections. Let's delve into uh, the IP tables mode though because it is the default. Because this mode essentially just writes out IP tables rules, we could determine how we're going to reach our services by inspecting all of the IP tables rules. So IP table save spits out a ton of information, most of it pretty scary, but it, it in the end just gives us a linear list that gets followed until matches for our individual services are found. So let's start with looking at the kubectl get on a given service of Kubernetes dashboard. In this example, when we look through our IP table save dash L output, we get this rule here for kubeserv that satisfies uh, that we want to be hitting the kube services service range there with the 172 address. We're matching on the TCP option and we even have a successful comment for what this is supposed to be used for. We're saying this is the Kubernetes dashboard cluster IP. And then we, we want to match all of the TCP traffic destined for this given service and jump to kube service XG blah, 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 blah. So let's uh, take a look for that kube service blah, blah, blah in the output. That next jump leads us to yet another separator. And this line in the end directs us over to the final destination of 172.30, the cluster IP of the service, which we can tell in the end matches if we do a kubectl pod describe. And the DNET that you're seeing in here is actually the destination network address translation that happens when we're jumping around between these given pods. Now you might be wondering, why do we need to jump through all these hops instead of just pointing to the first line in the IP tables rules that directs us to the given endpoint? The answer is a lot clearer when you have multiple pods. So let's take a look at a service node local DNS that we know has multiple pods spread out across multiple nodes. We first look at the cluster IP for the node local DNS pod and find multiple rules, one for each protocol. We have TCP and UDP, if we look at the dash M flag. Let's trace the UDP protocol jump. So once again, our grep shows two different rule sets and we see more options beyond the simple jump that we saw in Kubernetes dashboard. So let's just trace, uh, one, keep tracing that UDP one. And this option, we have a random probability mode of IP tables. And this uses a random number generator to cause 33% of the traffic to hit one endpoint, and the second rule, 50% uh, of the time, will hit a different endpoint. Now, on subsequent request, contract will be able to remember and for the request over the same connection, so you're not going to get multiple things hitting multiple different backing pods. And if we continue to follow that 33% rule, we line it on our final rule which just denets the traffic over to our destination endpoint of 172. So in summary, each service will have a kube service rule for each different port. And we'll also see a number of kube service hash entries with various endpoint weights for each port. Each port endpoint will see a small number of kube separator hashes with a denetted pod endpoint, depending on how many different nodes this is running on. And that exact number can also be influenced by the total number of endpoints and whether you have a bunch of node ports or load balancers in the way. 
So we can see a huge chunk of uh, IP tables was dedicated to this. We can also uh, use DNS to refer to these things. We don't have to remember these cluster IPs. And Kubernetes provides this with core DNS. The pod service IPs is stable for core DNS, so you don't need to uh, constantly be killing your cache in order to hit the possible IP that you want. And the final uh, method that we can use for reaching things inside of a cluster is ingress. And ingress operates at the layer seven level. Popular controllers that provide this are HA proxy and ingress nginx. The current API is uh, a little limited in scope in order to have maximum portability at HTTP level, but there has been enhancements to specify this a little and make it a little clear with the version one offered in Kubernetes 1.19. But here's a basic example which you'll be familiar with if you've seen Nginx or Apache configuration. And in this example, we're focusing on the My App service, which is backed by something listening on port 80. And we want to, once we hit this ingress controller specified by an IP address at the special path directory there, we want to forward on to the my app. Now let's move into the second part of our presentation with Srini to talk about ways that we can get around some of these limitations where we have multiple entries for these things per service. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks Chris. Um, Chris has talked about uh, networking in Kubernetes um, and he also talked about the services, different types of services like Nordport or Load Balancer. As you can see here, whether uh, services are used to connect to a backend L4 workload or L7 workload, they are dedicated. But with L7, we have ingress controllers which will allow you to have in traffic connect to multiple workloads in the backend. That means we can share a single connection. Um, there are many popular ingress controllers like Nginx, Envoy, Traffic, etc. available. But if you look at uh, L4, something is missing here. I would like to demo a solution to the problem we have here. How can I expose my L4 internal workloads in a shared way using an L4 ingress? Um, the problem, uh, as you can see, a user has to know uh, how to connect to load balances for service A or service B to connect to the backend workloads uh, on part A1 or part B1. This is not a hypothetical requirement we are trying to solve. Our internal team required um, to have uh, such a shared connection for their L4 services uh, to minimize the cost connections and wanted the application to be portable. Primary motivation is cost, of course. We wanted our solution to be user-friendly so that I do not have to remember many IP addresses of all the load balancers I'm creating. Uh, and also have a uniform way to manage the infrastructure. The main problem can be broken into three simple problems. How do I open additional ports on a load balancer to make it share? How do I associate the ports to the back end pods? And how do I give this accessing information back to the end user? For example, the user should be able to query a simple Kubernetes object to get the IP address in the port of a well-known uh, service uh, that he wants to connect to. So if you look here, uh, I have a custom resource object called shared LB, SLB in chart. Uh, the expected goal is to use information through kube control and you and be able to connect to your application and load balancer being transparent. You see the custom object here called shared LB that is providing connectivity information you need and also refer to the cloud infrastructure set load balancer just in case uh, like uh, shared LB has four instances here. Four instances are using the same external IP, which is the IP of the load balancer. Uh, with different ports, 4001 connects to a backend application, 4002 connects to a different backend application. To simplify the view now, we have instead of two uh, load balances, we have one shared load balancer with two ports, port A and port B connected to different um, backend applications. 
Now my application is sharing the load balancer. This is more cost effective, user friendly, minimum operation efforts, reusing existing Kubernetes as assets without reinventing the wheel, consistent with Kubernetes programming model. Let me explain this in detail. A load balancer's incoming port is connected to a node port of an internal service, which we create, to a target port of the pod, which is running the workload. Three things are happening here. Um, we derive the information from the custom resource object that the user created, and we create a service, Kubernetes service in the backend. And we create or use an existing load balancer by just opening a port or and then associate the service with the load balancer. So the entire connectivity happens for us. So as you can see, there are five steps here in the diagram. Step one, user creates a shared LP with the information we need. Uh, using that, we either find an existing LP uh, load balancer or we create a new load balancer and we create a port on that. And we also, in step three, create a a normal Kubernetes service uh, with source ports and target ports and proper label selectors uh, derived from the spec of the um, CR object we created. And then this is connected to the backend uh, workload um, using Kubernetes mechanisms. And once we do that, in step four, we get the information about the IP and the port that we have created, like port A, and put that information back into the custom resource object. And in step five, user uh, runs queue control command to get that information from the shared uh, LB. Uh, we use uh, cloud providers SDK to do things like open a port, configure security groups, incoming rule to make firewall happy, to pass through traffic to this port, uh, create internal service um, that uses Kubernetes network to talk to the workload. We're making sure that the traffic hits the internal service using our LB port rules. Um, we are using CRDs as a facade for the end user. And namespace CRDs are used, so there are no security concerns. Uh, create real load balancer on demand basis and manage the life cycle of it. Um, we make uh, N uh, configurable, which is the number of the capacity of the load balancer, so you can. By default, it is five. You can have five connections on the load balancer, or you can tune it to whatever number you want, depending on the criteria on the throughput of your workloads or you know um, the latency on the workloads, etc. We adopt all the best practices um, for the for the controller, uh, like the controller ref, uh, finalizers, etc., to clean up the objects. Let us do a demo. I mean, our uh, solution works on all the cloud providers, but right now I want to show you uh, on Google Cloud. Um, we have a three node cluster on GKE. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, let's create four deployments, four workloads running in GKE. We have a definition of the shared load balancer on GKE. And now, um, if you look at the shared, uh, shared LB uh, customer resource objects, there are none. So we need to create four for the four workloads. So we created all the four. At this point in time, our controller reacts and creates load balancer. How many load balancers do you think it created? It creates only one. Even though we, we pushed four shared LBs to be created concurrently, the controller is smart enough to create one load balancer for you. If you go to the GKE console and look at here for the load balancers, there is one load balancer created. And of course we create this load balancer with one port, uh, default dummy port um, for creation. We need that. So 33333 is used as dummy port. We can ignore that. Um, but now we have, we started processing this four shared and base. So that means we are going to open four ports and as you can see, two of those shared LBs are already processed and you got the uh, IP address associated and the port numbers. And uh, associated services will show you the port numbers we created on the load balances, 31, 725, 30, 30, All these ports are created on the load balance. So if you go back to the GKE console and it's 
Now refresh, you see all those four ports are open on the load balancer. Not only that, we also created a firewall rule on this um, network. Uh, so uh, we open uh, all the ports from 30,000 to 32,767 for both TCP and UDP. Uh, we, we can only do uh, one firewall rule for each of the ports we open, but this way, you know, it's simpler. We'll have one rule. And uh, as you can see, there is only one external IP that we are paying for. Uh, with four forwarding rules for four workloads that we are running inside our Kubernetes cluster. So each of those ports correspond to one workload. And in the SLP is now, they're all populated with the external IP and the port. So you can cat any of these IPs and ports and you should be able to reach the backend application. Um, now going back to um, of our presentation. As you can see, uh, now we have um, presentations available, um, similar demos available for Azure, um, Amazon, and uh, IBM Clouds. Uh, but in the interest of time, I would like to conclude, and our information is provided here if you are interested in this uh, uh, solution, you can, uh, you can reach out to us. Uh, with that, I'll open up uh, for questions, thanks for listening to us. I'm grateful to be here. Um, I'm grateful for your questions. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, so we're still sitting around for the next few minutes just to answer any questions you guys might have about the presentation. We have one question here in the chat about what the potential cost savings of this approach would be, and it's it's really dependent on which cloud you're using. Uh, a lot of this is based on prices that get charged, as referred to, number of load balances load balancers created, or if you have a significant amount of services. So it's, it's really gonna be dependent on your cloud provider. So it's, it's a little off to try to figure out exactly how much cloud savings or exactly how much dollar amount it would be. Um, on the, the second question we see, uh, can the shared load balancer CRD be made to work with a bare metal infrastructure? Uh, yes, it could, assuming that you are using uh, some sort of bare metal infrastructure that provides APIs for gathering this sort of information, um, such as uh, in the OpenStack world, there's different types of APIs available that some people have ported over to work on bare metal as well. So if there's an API, one could be able to do it. Another question, what's the performance of the integrated load balancer? I assume it's running in the kernel space, how to control and guarantee some level performance. Uh, so this is also gonna be dependent on the, the load balancer of your choice, depending on the cloud provider. Since all we're really doing with the CRD is talking to the load balancer that you already have, uh, it's gonna be the same level of performance as what you're already getting from that cloud provider. We're just slotting in more information. Uh, let's see, uh, fourth question on uh, running a private infrastructure. There's uh, 4 million requests per second, private cloud, uh, and they're worried about you know what, what to do since they don't have infinite capacity uh, on the load balancers. What technology can station multiple load balancers like Nginx to distribute the inbound request over all the load balancers? Uh, this is kind of a general Kubernetes question. Uh, you can often have uh, like an overall load balancer uh, atop some of these things. 
to distribute the, the request. There's nothing in um, Kubernetes uh, natively that does this. It's almost more of like a layering approach such that um, you can distribute it out uh, with like a master global load balancer, or you can use a project similar to, to Istio or roll your own with Envoy so that you can have more of a global view and space it out based on requests or whatever circuit breaker policies that you have set up for that. I think that's so the four questions. Um, if, if you have follow-up um, replies or questions, um, please visit us in the number two cloud of networking uh, Slack channel and we can answer more questions in there.